Hello. Yeah. Can you all see me? Yeah. Let me settle myself. Okay, okay. Yeah, good morning. Oh, I need to sit down well. Yeah. Good morning, Ritesh. Chandran, Chandrayaan News. <laughs> yes, that's a great feeling. How's the weather? It's pretty cold here. It's almost uh, nice, pleasant towards the chill. Good morning. Good morning, all of you. Good morning, good morning. So how is your weather there? All good and nice? It's humid, rainy. Chalo, it's rainy, it's nice. Extremely humid. Oh. Okay. Fine, then let's get started. It's time now. Others have joined us more or less, those who had to join. Um, okay, we'll discuss those questions. Heat wave, uh, yeah, heat wave, but not as bad. Okay, we, we are used to worse conditions back in India. So, right then, Bita. So, so we have some questions left. Uh, from the sections. Uh, two questions I did not discuss last time. Uh, one was the concept of cultural hearth. I guess let's get started now. It's time now. Okay. One is the concept of cultural hearth and other, of course, the concept of uh, like a secularization. And the question I asked you was, it is still valid today or not? So let's start with the concept of cultural hearth. Let me explain this to you. And then I'll give the uh, facts and details. Cultural hearth. Okay. Now, uh, in your perspectives, in your perspectives, your thought section, there is a topic called as cultural regions. Uh, not at all a difficult topic. It's a very simple topic. Okay, but and they have been asking questions on this. So there are many schemes of cultural regions. Uh, the one that you can go by is the more popular one, uh, which you also find on the net. You can go by that more or less, uh, which divides the world into regions based on some kind of cultural similarity okay. and cultural similarity uh, we're talking about uh, religion we're talking about language so so if you have a question on cultural region okay if you have a question on uh, cultural region uh, let the definition start let the answer start with a brief definition and an explanation. So you explain uh, that it is a region, that it is a region of some kind of cultural uh, homogeneity. Okay. And when we say cultural, we're talking about mainly uh, two elements. One is religion, other is language and linked to this we also add racial aspects wherever relevant and we get what's called as ethnicity ethnicity so the cultural regions that we have are essentially a type of ethnic regions 
um, some of you who do not know this idea, the word ethnicity also includes the concept of location. There is a concept of territory. So if you have a particular culture, say Arabic culture, to this you add the place called as Arabia, we get the Arabian ethnicity. We have the culture, okay, which is probably Japanese. Okay. Uh, to that, you add the place called as Japan, and you get Japanese ethnicity. So maybe in a short uh, uh, paragraph, you explain what is the concept of culture, cultural regions, and then you can talk about the broad regions. So the very broad regions, we have four of them. Okay the broad regions that you can talk about, and then the subdivisions. The broad regions that we have are the Occidental Rim, the Occidental, which means the Western Rim. We have the Islamic Rim. We have the Indian, Indian Rim, and we have the East Indian. East Indian, uh, this is largely your Indochina. Indochina, okay. And uh, the Occidental Rim itself, you can divide into, okay, the, the North American, the European, it also includes Australian, uh, the Islamic realm, you can divide into okay, Iran and Persia and other Arabic speaking nations. Arabic speaking nations. Iran is not Arabic, Iran is Persian. And there are a couple of minor ones. Minor ones. So in minor ones, you can talk about the African rim. You can talk about the African rim. And subdivisions of the Indian also. The Indian, again, is not entirely same. Okay. And uh, East Asian. Now, this is a debate. Uh, East Asia. Okay, uh, some would like to put it East Asia under the major ones. Okay, major ones, which includes China, Korea, Japan, and in themselves, they also are very unique. The Japanese culture is not exactly the Chinese culture. Minor one can also include Central Asia. The minor also includes Central Asian. Minor also can include okay, the Latin American. Okay, Latin American is also considered to be minor. And of course, in Europe itself, in Europe, we have the Nordic regions. We have the Balkan regions. Okay. We have the Swiss German region. Okay. So you don't need to know all the all of them, but have an idea. And based on this, you can always draw maps. Okay. Now, this was about, I said two things. One is define and explain the concept. What is it? The second one was okay, list down the regions. What are the regions? You are kind of listing down. Okay. Then you need to know. You have some doubts. Then you need to know what to write on each of them. Don't read too much on this. Okay. So what to write down? You must talk about what religion each area has. 
what language each area has. You can talk about okay how that area has developed. You can talk about the impact of urbanization and what type of society in the form of development the area has become. So even if you write, okay, say a small two, three sentence on this, this will be about half a page. Okay. Now, this is something most of you know. If you organize the answer, these are three things we know. We know that uh, uh, this is a definition. They say these are the regions and an explanation on each. Now, what I want is get a bit of technical geography into this. Okay. When I say technical geography, I mean link this to geographical thought. And you can do this by three ways. One is talk about the concept of cultural landscapes. Okay, so Carl Saur's name, the Berkeley School. Okay, you might have a passing reference to Otto Scluter, but that's your choice. So that's one. Talk about the cultural landscape concept. The second, you talk about the concept of cultural hearth. See, I don't expect that they will ask you cultural hearth. Okay, but it's nice if you can know something. Okay. Uh, Radzel's cultural landscape, yes, you can. You can add not a problem. Okay. Now the cultural hearth concept comes from what? See, the word hearth essentially means a fireplace. Fireplace, which is equivalent to cooking equivalent to home, it's kind of the core of the house. Similarly, when I use the word hearth in the context of culture, okay, this is where it all began. These are the source regions. Cultural hearths are source regions from where culture spread. Okay. Please keep taking down the notes. So cultural hearth concept is a concept in studying cultural landscape. Okay. It is the concept in studying cultural landscape. The objective is not description of present cultures. The objective is not description. The objective is to understand how the cultures originated and how they have spread. Like think of the Arabic realm. The Arabic realm, the fulcrum in many ways is Saudi Arabia and its adjoining regions. But from there on, the culture spread towards Africa, right up to Morocco. Okay, the impact of, if not Arabic, the impact of Islam has spread. Okay, that's one of the process that we have in cultural expansion. Similarly, Egypt itself for, is an important cultural hearth. The Nile Valley civilization, or think of Harappan Valley civilization. Okay, so, so the objective of studying cultural health is not simply describing what the cultures are, but to understand how cultures have spread. 
okay and what are the origin regions of the cultures okay now in that sense there are many types of cultural herds now we have one scheme that says there are there are original cultural herds okay there are original culture herds and we have certain modern cultural herds the original ones where it all began this is the areas of very ancient history and we identify okay uh, mainly six of them which is the nile valley the indus valley okay the the yunnan valley the yunnan valley of china southern china yunnan valley we have the gangetic plains okay we have mesopotamia and we have west africa the nile valley the indus valley the yunnan civilization this was china the ganga plains mesopotamia and west africa okay and to understand why they became the source regions is to do largely with the physical conditions all of them grew as a consequence of agriculture this was uh, mostly just after the first agricultural revolution what we call as the neolithic age this happened after the neolithic age so this was pretty okay so if you can put the time uh, most civilizations are in the range of 5000 to 4000 bc okay plus or minus it all depends on local conditions so the concept of cultural herd is part of understanding cultural regions cultural herds are areas of the source regions cultural herd is from where the original culture started and then spread okay developing the cultural regions of today so we have the old civilizations here the nile valley the indus valley the yunnan valley the ganga plains mesopotamia west africa these are those old ones most of them are associated with the physical conditions so while discussing physical conditions you can relate this to concept of environmental determinism okay so these cultures were actually the consequence of environment the cultures were the consequence of fertile soil enough of river water tropical conditions for agriculture okay they were flat plains okay so you can talk in terms of soil talk in terms of plains talk in terms of climate temperature rainfall and all this culture if you can see they are in the tropical belt so climate does play a role okay so cultural herd is a good concept in appreciating the man environment relationship is a good concept in appreciating the environmental controls that have determined a society and its civilization okay so let the answer start off from there description what's the concept now the another concept is okay the concept of modern cultural herds what are 
द मॉडर्न कल्चरल हर्थ ना मॉडर्न कल्चरल हर्थ दीज आर द पोस्ट इंडस्ट्रियलाइजेशन ओके रीजन्स ओके एंड दे हैव स्प्रेड ओके एक पुट इन कॉमर्स the modern cultures do i use the word modern understand this is a bit ethnocentric because we are definitely equating this to the influence of europe okay so that's why i have put the word modern inside commas and these centers include western europe a very powerful center has been okay north america in particular the influence of northeast and eastern us okay northeast and eastern us uh, in in the context of western europe you can relate the western europe with Spain, Portugal, the English, and all of them ultimately were colonizers. Okay, so be it what did they spread? So be it language, food, clothing, and many ways. the western world has played a role in defining our our modern evolving ethical considerations say think about okay, the way I, i'm forget about the history of the civilizations but the way human rights is talked about okay the way we talk about the concept of okay abortion rights the way we talk about democracy voting okay the typical western notions of democracy the way we talk about reforms okay related to children women so these modern cultural herds they have also decided lot of modern ethical considerations okay so western europe and north america now the more recent ones we can add okay three important influences three uh, uh, new influences which in includes western us california it also includes china the culture that we have developed around shanghai and hong kong and the third one is the indic so india also plays very important role okay as one of the centers of modern cultural herds and they talk about our own value systems a very important export in recent times has been yoga from india okay a very important export has been okay meditation these are all part of okay uh, cultural symbols now okay and india's spread of diaspora diaspora okay so this has also expanded india's influence so so you can see this in the food okay um, we talk about cuisine so in the modern cultural herds we have some of these okay and these are the products of the modern industrial and 
urbanized cultures. Most of them, okay, West US, okay, California becomes important after 1980s. Whereas China, India, they have become more important since 1990s. So I repeat, the question was, what is the concept of cultural hurt? So you have to talk in terms of how these are part of the cultural region concept. And we're talking about the new centers also, from where we have new set of cultural diffusion. So what's the original one? What are the modern ones? Now, I want you to add something more to this. You must add, talk about what is cultural diffusion and how it happens. Okay. Cultural diffusion is essentially about how cultures spreads. Okay, so the culture spread came the consequence of what we call as simply diffusion. Okay, cultural spread as a consequence of diffusion. Diffusion as in when people come in contact with the new cultures, they start adopting the new cultures. A typical way lot of western culture okay has been adopted uh, typical way how language grows okay when people come in contact when they uh, come in uh, uh, some kind of uh, you know um, say transactional relationships where we must talk we must exchange we must trade so this is one type and uh, this type of diffusion cultural diffusion happens as a consequence of contact, happens as a consequence of sometimes hierarchy, okay, like say the spread of English language okay, through the colonial process was something like hierarchy. Okay, we had institutions of education controlled by the West. We had the trade economy controlled by the West. And they start influencing what is right, what's wrong. See, it's like this. Uh, what is the difference between contact diffusion and hierarchy diffusion? Okay. Difference is, see, in contact diffusion, say I know a language and I come to having friendship with another person who knows another language and as we are interacting as we are okay trying to communicate i learn a bit of l2 and this one learns a bit of l1 okay that's about contact okay i meet a person okay and i like the food that he eats i like the clothes that he wears Okay, and I start also adopting some of this food, adopting some of these cultures. Okay, this is something like the spread because of contact. Okay, but there's another form where, along with contact, we also have the role of hierarchy. Along with contact, we have the role of hierarchy. The hierarchy thing is a sense of superiority okay, or a sense of inferiority. Culture A starts adopting culture B because it thinks B is superior or B starts promoting its culture because it thinks it is superior. So either A can accept B is superior or B internalizes that they are superior and they shift. Have you heard of a, something called as Sanskritization? 
have heard of this and the example or the consequence of this is something called as acculturation so acculturation is adoption of cultures but in sanskritization there is an element of hierarchy operating yes shrinivasan okay so the hierarchy diffusion is the consequence of some kind of sense of cultural inequality and that some cultures are more preferable some cultures okay are more superior and yes using this you can get into cultural hegemony okay using this idea that we are superior or somebody else is superior it can result in cultural hegemony whereas acculturation is a uh, more of a generic word which means adopting cultures why you adopt cultures can be many reasons so cultural so contact diffusion can also be acculturation and sanskritization can also be a type of acculturation you can see the see my intention of this discussion is that we have relate some of the concepts with what's happening under globalization okay what they per perhaps may not directly ask you what is cultural hearth okay this topic i was discussing i repeat they might probably not directly ask you what is cultural hearth but the cultural hearth concept is related to globalization and the way the cultures have spread in recent times okay so in globalization what has happened is we have developed new centers of modern cultural hearth we have developed the modern cultural hearths and because these are modern these are new phenomena and what are the processes by which culture spreads so i'm linking this spread from the new cultural hearth how lot of expansion was the consequence of okay contact diffusion but more the consequence of hierarchy diffusion okay so diffusion itself okay can be studied in terms of contact diffusion can be studied in terms of hierarchy diffusion okay yes you 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 know some words yes brahmanization okay yes is one type of the hierarchy diffusion okay but i'll suggest that use examples from outside india because see i mean this is being a bit more smart and pragmatic uh you do not know who is checking your papers you do not know uh, who is coming with what kind of biases so it is safer i'm not saying it's wrong it is safer that these tricky topics you don't trap yourself into okay getting judged on the wrong lines so yes we do have brahmanization you can talk about okay uh, the spread of uh, hindutva or the the missionary activities of christians or even some of the examples how islam has spread okay but i'll suggest don't get into that okay there are other examples to give these are tricky areas so keep it to western expansion colonial expansion keep it to expansion of okay the american fast food culture you know the dominoes and and the uh, and the uh, you know pizza culture the pasta culture so these are good examples and these are safe examples you will not get uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, penalized because of this okay so just be careful okay because see this is not the avenue where you vent out what you feel because you are being evaluated here so i repeat so when you talk about hierarchical diffu diffusion give the example from colonial expansion give examples related to fast 
a food culture give examples related to uh, how how education has spread education systems okay so india adopting okay the macula minutes okay we have our education structure set up during the colonial times is an example of okay yes it's an example of asymmetrical exchange that's a nice word the hierarchical diffusion is a type of asymmetrical exchange okay so what i ultimately was want is that take this answer towards the idea of what globalization has done what globalization has done how technology and social media has been important for okay the new cultural hearths and the cultural diffusion okay now linked to this is the concept of secularization linked to this is the concept of secularization and what we now called as call as the post secular world or the post secular phase so it's a question mark but then we have enough reasons to believe that we have moved towards a post secular age so is it okay till here all of you is it okay till here explaining the concept of what is cultural hearth and how i want the answer to move towards globalization spread of culture colonial history okay discuss the role of technology the role of mass media okay so then you are getting into a bit more of geography then and beyond this also we will discuss this idea called as okay secularization and the post secular concept can we use this in essays of globalization yes you can but then use the wisdom from this not the technical words technical words as in don't use karl sauer's name don't use the idea of okay you know or don't just use the word contact diffusion explain what contact how it has explained the wisdom that there is a cultural asymmetry and expansion that's okay okay so uh, in a says i suggest whenever you write down some kind of an answer uh, make sure that your optional is not very obvious in your essay okay and you can use whatever other uh, examples you want okay yes homogenization of culture yes correct okay it has been a part of homogenization okay the way uh, our uh, you know uh, modern cultures have spread okay so now please come to the next concept what is this concept of secularization what is the concept of secularization okay now here yeah, please come here secularization now see uh, what does it mean it basically means a kind of a movement it's a kind of a process yeah don't worry please i we will share the answers with you first understand the concept know the idea then i give the answers to you okay so what is secularization it is a kind of a movement a kind of a process where progressively progressively religious values religious wisdom and religious logic and rationalization it gets gets increasingly 
irrelevant. Okay? So secularization is a process. It is a movement. It's a progressive one. Okay? Where religious values, religious wisdom, religious logic and religious rationalization gets irrelevant. As in, you don't talk in terms of religious ethics anymore. You don't want to explain everything as a consequence of God has created things. We don't want to get into the debates of, okay, how religion is becoming the more, how religion can explain all type of theories. Okay? So secularization is kind of making a religion defunct. Okay? It results in religious identity okay, increasingly becoming irrelevant. Okay. The religion is defunct. Religion does not serve any function. Okay. See, one of the very important roles of religion has been to maintain social order. It tells us what's good, what is bad. It stops people from doing wrong things. But then we say that when you have grown scientifically, you have grown as a part of a, a, you know, a good governed society, where you have got laws, you have got constitutions, you have got rule of law, where there's deterrent in punishments. You do not need God here now. You don't need God to tell you what's good, what's bad. You know, you don't pay taxes, you'll be punished. You cross the road when you're having a red light, you'll get penalized. So your action is not controlled by religious sanction. Your actions are not controlled by religious reasons, but they're more about governance aspects. Okay. And slowly, gradually, your religious identity also becomes irrelevant. Okay. Now, there's something called as secularization theses. There is a secularization thesis. It's a kind of a theory. And this is a sociological concept okay, in which Max Weber has been very important. Okay, So don't know all these terms. I mean, don't expand them elaborately. Just know what these words are. So we have the secularization thesis that talks about this progressive change. Okay. It's a kind of a model that tells us that when society, so what does the thesis tells us? It tells us as societies modernize, as societies urbanize, okay, as we have industrialization and post-industrialization, religion is less of a consequence. Okay, so, so we mean basically an irreligious society okay when i use the word the secularism thesis or the secularism process now how did it start yes somebody said this is the consequence of rinasa yes rinasa but more importantly it was the consequence of industrialization and post-industrial societies. Do you remember the word called modernism now? Do you remember the word modernism, all of you? Okay. We talked about anti-positivism. We have talked about okay, objectivity, rationality. We have talked about how modernism is about science. Okay, no longer speculation, yes. And you remember the term enlightenment project? Modernism related to enlightenment project. Okay, yes, where it was like a movement. And this was the positivism movement. Okay. No, not radical. Please forget about radical right now. To talk about modernism. Radical 
okay phase marxism happens okay afterwards this is the the 17th the 18th century the enlightenment project okay in which lot of thinkers have come up and talked about what is a modern society okay the enlightenment project now linked to this is also the expansion of european colonies okay so when europeans start spreading okay they started using the word okay of modernization in terms of anti religion so it's a very very western concept okay the secularism hai or the secularism thesis is a very very western concept it was made popular with the expansion of the colonial because in the west in the west with science technology they were getting influenced by more rational okay reasons rather than okay uh, the reasons around god so secularization as of the world in some ways happens after the colonialization yes there is an element of irony here okay yes secular secular secularism no not secularism secularization okay it's a different word secularism is different the way we see secularism is not that one we're talking about secularization yes somebody has pointed out that this is actually a bit of an irony on one hand the western world is talking about modernity religion as less important science objectivity positivism on the other hand the western world was also guilty of the fact they did spread lot of their religious values to the other worlds okay be it in the form of impacting the tribal societies uh, you can talk about the missionary efforts so this is a bit of a contradiction it is a bit of okay uh, an irony that it was also the west who actually got lot of religion okay into our uh, issues okay but nevertheless the word secular secularization as a philosophical movement okay as a movement in okay intellectual thinking this said that religion is less important and the society should move towards becoming a religious so that's secularization but now we have one more idea called as post secular societies now this is a very new concept okay this we are talking acha by the way uh, this modernization okay uh, continues but in post modernization something else is happening okay so you can link it on your own there but now i'm saying what is happening to our society now when i say now i'm talking about 1980s onwards 1990 onwards okay our society is increasingly becoming more religious now okay this lot of again faith healing going on no faith healing as in you believe in the culture of god men spiritual gurus okay uh, you're talking in uh, how people uh, you know even their political affiliations okay the political affiliations they also are based on religion okay so we have the revival of okay a conservative catholic thoughts we have revival of hindutva we have okay the fundamentalism in islam and not just that i'm what surprising is even buddhism you're seeing what's happening in sri lanka if you know this 
ठीक है बुद्धिज्म अदरवाइज डिड नॉट हैव दिस कल्चर ऑफ यू नो और डिड नॉट हैव द कल्चर दैट प्रोमोटेड एनी काइंड ऑफ वायलेंस और सब्जुगेशन ओके सो इवन श्रीलंका वे द सिंहालास आर गेटिंग असर्टिव Sihala is getting assertive. Again, please be careful here. How you write the answer? Make sure you keep the answer a bit more global specific. Keep the answer a bit more relevant in terms of the outside world. Don't get into too much of debate about India, because I, I repeat, this is not an exercise where you are airing your views in general. Okay, this is not a creative exercise or writing. Okay, an article because you think about something. This is a very directed process of evaluating you and choosing you for a job. So make sure that you don't end up stamping on somebody's feet. So it's nice if you just have a quick passing reference, okay, about India, but talk about the world. That's better. Like you talk about the world, uh, talk about the trends in the U.S., talk about the trends in Britain, in France. Okay, you have got examples in China where there is revivalism of uh, Confucianism. Uh, so talk in that context. So we are becoming, okay, probably again religious, and in many ways, our religious ideas. they are now conflicting the our religious ideas are now conflicting with what was considered to be modern once upon a time so we are at conflicts now now from this you can now move towards how geography also is post modernism and geography is now post structuralism both these trends okay are talking about a post secular world now see i have not got into the debate of why have we become okay more religious or why has the world moved towards this post secular thinking it could be related to frustrations with the western models it could be related about loss of identity in the process of homogenization of the cultures it could be related to sometimes parochial narrow political ambitions okay uh, it can be because of uh, you know a kind of frustration where the modernism did not deliver under globalization so there are many reasons why this is happening okay there are many reasons yes migration could also be a reason okay where there is conflict with the uh, local population there are perceptions involved here okay but i'll suggest you don't get into too much of that discussion for geography you don't get into too much of uh, i know uh, uh, debates on this for geography answer know the concept what is post secular and then say that there are two three trends you yeah, listen in post uh, secular narrative in post secular narrative there are some trends like okay. trends are trends are about acknowledging acknowledging that religious value systems are important they are significant influencers Okay, we need, we need to acknowledge this. Okay, you cannot talk about society where religion is not important. You must accept the fact that religion is important today. 
Okay, it is an influencer. Okay, you are you are seeing religion being used in our trade and commerce, the way we advertise our products. Usme religion aa hai. The way we make choices about what we will eat, what we will not eat. There is an element of religion again here. So we need to acknowledge that. The second trend is, second trend is that religion, religion must again enter academic discourse. Academic discourse. And this is where the post-structuralism comes in. Okay. So there was an idea in the modernism or modernization that we had that religion doesn't matter. Marxism talks about religion doesn't matter. But post-structuralism says no, religion matters. Okay, gender rights, political institutions, people's thought process, the way we think, the way we rationalize. So we need to get religion studies back into academics. Okay, so one is acknowledge it exists. Second is get into the academics of religion, study how it impacts. And third is we need to develop institutions now. We need to develop institutions to deal with this phenomena. With this phenomena. Okay. So post secular society is a kind of a reality. Now, what I will do is I will share an article with you. Okay. I'll put it on your uh, email. There's an article. And uh, this is a pretty nice summary. It's a bit longer one, but it is a pretty nice summary about what uh, this concept is. And you may remember uh, two names here. Okay, remember two names who, who have been uh, the main proponents of this post secular idea. One is Jurgen Habermas, J U R G E N. Habermas, in 1990s, he has given the concept, post-secularism. And another ma ma man is Jose, or Jose, actually Jose Casanova. Okay, so these two are the people who have started the debates towards a post-secular world. Uh, they have talked about uh, how uh, it is now one of those competing concepts you can't ignore anymore. One of the competing concepts. Okay. So my suggestion to you is, now this is the concept. This concept more or less good enough for an answer. Now my suggestion to you is this. Answers on globalization. Answers on cultural diffusion, if any. Okay. I talk about the concept of cultural hearth also. You talk about conflicts. Conflicts are a very important theme in almost all academic discourse today. Conflicts and conflict management. Okay. So if you have an answer around this, okay, in which you can also choose to add issues of gender, the gender roles, the gender preferences. Okay. I'll suggest you move the answer towards the concept of post 
secularism. It can be a very nice discussion point for your essays also. Okay, the dynamics, the why of this, why are we moving towards post secular? Okay, now this is not an easy answer because it is still a very new process. Okay, just about 10 15 years process or 20 years ka process hua hai, is too early for us to comment on what probably is going wrong or what are the reasons why it's happening but yes somewhere way down we know this is an issue of identity we are not religious as in religious to do good and go to heaven okay we are more religious as a consequence of asserting ourselves so religion is now becoming the basis of empowerment. You know, uh, something like you think of the caste systems. The caste systems, sometime in the past, would serve some kind of function. The society was organized. There was a hierarchy. Who would do what? Okay. And yes, the caste system served the purpose of a higher caste dominating and controlling the lower castes. So it was a very functional thing. Okay. It evolved from the idea of Varna system, it becomes something. But today, the caste system is more around empowerment, around identity. Okay. That's the reason why okay, you form your political affiliations around caste. So even if you are supposingly the historical low caste, with your caste identity, you're able to mobilize yourself into a force. Okay. Historically, you have been part of the receiving end. But today, what we find is that we are developing our identity around it. We're developing our okay, a political organization around it. So this could be a good passing reference. Okay, so the, the reasons why it happens, I don't want to dwell on it right now. It is too uh, simplistic then, but you could use an idea that this is the consequence of some bit of identity issues in the globalized world. Okay, just keep it at that. Don't elaborate too much on this. So I hope I've answered your two questions now. Try your answer now on this. Okay. Uh, what is the concept of cultural hurt? So that's a short note I have given you. And is okay secularization still relevant? Still relevant may you bring that discussion towards a post-secular world. So you start with how it was relevant while talking about the so-called modernization, but post-modernization post-structuralism there is a question mark now okay whether we should be ignoring religion anymore okay the, the debates about acknowledging the religious ideas the debates about developing institutions and debates about how we must have more studies around regions okay uh, gender issues yes religion has been a very important instrument in subjugation of the women so patriarchy has a sanction of religion patriarchy has a sanction of faith okay so there's a very powerful role of uh, religious uh, institutions and practices that have perpetuated the the, the 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 concept of women's subjugation and the notions of patriarchal superiority so yes, you can move the answer towards that. Institutions, we need to have bodies, we need to have governance. Like think of, we have a temple trust. Okay, a temple trust where there are bureaucrats who are appointed. Okay, so an institution around religion. 
Okay, think of uh, a Hajj committee, for example, which has a sanction of the government. This institution, okay, around religion, and we can formalize, okay, an institution where religious discourse is encouraged as a part of maybe conflict resolution. So we need bodies, we need formal structures, we need formal appointments if possible. In in India, have you heard about the Waqf Board? Yeah, Muslims have what's called as the Waqf Board. W A Okay, Q. Have you heard about this word, Waqf Board? Okay, that's an example of developing institutions to manage. Or in Christianity, you have got those religious parishes. Okay, you have uh, the bishops leading those units. Okay, it's again an example of uh, institution based around religion. Okay, so so we probably have to do that to some extent. Okay. Which is a better society? <laughs> Rishabh, this is a difficult question. Better society is not about whether you are religious or not. It's about what do you do with your beliefs? Okay, so I don't believe in religion and I go and murder. Why? Because there's no God. So who will punish me? <laughs> Or I believe in religion and I cause conflicts. Okay, so this is a difficult, tricky question. Religious or not religious is not the issue. The issue is what do we do with it? If your religion keeps you grounded, if your religion gives you the strength okay, of controlling yourself, if your religion is a part of your okay, peace attainment, it's a very nice thing. If your modernism, scientific rationality is around, okay, more objective analysis, it's more about less of parochial ideas. So non-religious is also nice. Okay, so we'll not ask about uh, what is good or what's bad here. That's a process. Okay, so it's difficult to answer it like that. Yes, post-secularization is a phenomenon all over the world. Okay, we have revival of Catholic churches. We have revival of okay your Protestant cultures also. We are having a lot of uh, aggressive religious posturing across countries. We have racial conflicts that are degenerating into religious conflicts. Okay, so so yeah, the abortion laws, the rest. Okay. So, so without being judgmental, what I'm saying is, religion is an important issue today. Okay, there was a time when people thought secularization is modernization. Okay, secularization is part of, uh, uh, you know, becoming the modern society. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not necessarily the answer. The process can be both. Okay, you cannot separate cultural with political anymore. So secularism can be a political thing. It can be a cultural thing, and so can secularization be. Okay, so you can't divide it like that. In India, for example, even if I am not politically aligned. In my thinking, I can be secular, it becomes a cultural process. But if the state starts enforcing it on you, it becomes a political process. Okay, so, so both are possible. Okay, we'll not get into Ram Janma Bhumi issue. Let's not, uh, that's not purpose here, please. We are doing geography. Hello, good morning, all of you. Okay, so I'll suggest. Do not get into these debates in the geography answer. Okay, you tend to jump the gun. Okay, we'll hold it for yes. Good morning, Chandradeep. Aapka answer bana ya nahi bana? Okay, what is post secular thinking and is secularization relevant or not? Or not? Did you get the answer? Okay, so now try your writing. Okay, and see if you can. Uh, yes, there are other ways of culture diffusion. 
we have what's called as relocation also okay so there are other methods also okay while movement yes secularization religion is becoming less important but post secularization religion is becoming more important okay okay now now we'll move on okay you you, you understood the idea now the debate is going on on other sides now okay so that's about these two questions now let me oh my goodness do you think we are going too slow can i make it faster or are you okay with this am i too slow i don't know i can make it faster okay fine okay i just thought you should take down notes for this okay so i'm moving faster now so let's move on to the other questions okay let's move on to other questions uh now these topics i presume you should have read i'll quickly guide you discuss the concept of graded river okay now please be back on our discussions here but aap log itna sara chat yahan kaise kar lete ho aap log padhai kar rahe ho ya what are you doing okay you are getting into a wrong i mean you are old enough to understand all of this okay keep your social interactions minimum here okay focus on the class please you know, problem is not jab tak dhakka nahi lagta aap logon ko na samajh mein nahi aa raha aap log kaise time waste karte ho you are losing the focus of what we are doing okay get back now so the next question is what is the concept of graded river and what are the factors that determine a river grade so i think you know the concept a graded river is essentially a river that is okay in a state of a balance that is in some kind of okay a, a kind of equilibrium okay where the river is neither into net erosion nor is it into any net deposition the main role of a river in a case of grade is that it is performing the role of transportation okay so what's a graded river it's a kind of a state of balance okay it's a state of a balance it is a state of equilibrium the river performs the role of transportation alone so there is no net erosion and there is no net deposition so it's a kind of balance a very important point here is that it is a, a hypothetical state imaginary state we do not have examples of such rivers it's just a imagination that a river can be in such state okay and what is the graded profile a typical okay open concave profile is the graded profile okay so concave and the profile is of what the profile is of the river floor okay river course floor the profile is that of the river thalwick i'm presuming you know these words so i've explained what's the concept of the grid river who gave the concept gilbert had given the concept okay gk gilbert in many ways he is the pioneer and this concept was used by many other scholars including davis so what's the concept of a river grade what are the controls okay what are the controls of river grade okay the controls of river grade okay which includes factors related to the sediments there are sediments there are uh, uh, there is slope angle to it okay so what are the factors
factors the load the amount of load okay the slope of the course the discharge okay in in fact all these processes are related to the erosion capacity they related to the erosion capacity of the river okay and factor that disrupts this important one what are the factors that disrupt the attainment of grade a very important factor that disrupts is rejuvenation rejuvenation disrupts okay the river grade it disrupts the attainment of river grade okay and finally maybe some words on davis model so davis model talks about grade it talks about that the grade is achieved in the lower course the grade is achieved in the lower course and the grade grows upwards the grade is achieved in the lower course and the grade is growing upwards what i mean by this is that if this is the river okay then the attainment of grade happens in the late maturity here and slowly gradually the course becomes graded moving upwards so the smoothening the flattening happenings here and slowly gradually the river now gets graded so this slope ultimately becomes smoother in time okay uh, don't say headward erosion that's a, a dangerous sentence here okay uh, just say this okay and for davis a very important point is okay very important for davis is that the their grade is a function of age okay and the graded state is achieved at the lower maturity and you can have one discussion point additional is the concept of grade is actually incompatible with davisian model this you can add as a part of some discussion that the concept of grade is incompatible okay it is it does not fit into the concept of davis and that's because that's because okay. and that's because dekho the davis model is a closed system the davis model is a closed systems analysis okay in closed system the only balance possible is the balance possible is the final state the final state where we have maximum entropy and minimum energy so if something starts here the balance is only when it hits the ground here this is a state of minimum energy but grade for davis is happening somewhere here late maturity so if i go by the davisian okay if you go by the davisian possibility then this is very unlikely because if the river is attaining grade 
the river is neither eroding nor is it depositing it's impossible in davis model that the erosion can stop before the river reaches the base level okay so if i am accepting that grade is possible then i am saying that the river will not erode okay even before it reaches the base level so grade is a state of no net erosion okay now this is impossible before base level that's why when davis says okay so when davis says that grade is achieved in late maturity we say this is not possible so in your answer you had to have one sentence that the concept of grade was given by gilbert it was also used by davis and davis saw the concept of grade as a function of the age which is achieved in late maturity but such a concept is incompatible okay in the davisian closed system okay it is incompatible in the davisian closed systems analogy exactly pavan that's why we are saying it's a contradiction so you're right that's why it's a contradiction it's not possible it will happen okay so fine this question done let's take up the next question quickly okay let's take up another question quickly what is the concept of profile analysis like what is profile analysis discuss that usage okay now quick acha you want to know the page number if you have not read about the grade concept you have grade discussions uh, this is uh, the chapter of uh, uh, drainage morphometry okay in drainage morphometry page number 388 okay up to 393 that talks about how grades get disrupted 388 say 393 okay now the next concept is the concept of profile the concept of profile analysis now quickly like an answer okay so profile analysis what's happening yeah so profile analysis this is a mathematical this is a statistical technique to study relief diversity okay it's a mathematical method it is statistical method to study relief diversity it's a kind of a graph to depict landscapes and their features it's a graph to depict landscapes and their features is a very modern concept so what's done is what's done is at equal intervals at equal intervals 
the vertical cross section okay is taken and is plotted so imagine if this is the landscape okay say this is the landscape which has some valley here which has some mountain here which has something else here okay and say this is the base level so we draw a graph so this oo or ox and oy so ox represents the base level then along this cross section i have this profile at this cross section i again have the same profile somewhere farther away the mountain looks like this somewhere nearby a mountain looks like this okay think of some other plateau here the plateau will look like this what i have done is i have plotted the features on a graph now there are three ways of doing this okay there are three ways of doing this uh keep looking at my screen i have taken this uh the scanned uh, image from the textbook okay the image is on page number 384 okay so these are the profiles can you all see my screen all of you okay this is the profile can you see my screen yeah okay fine so this is what the profile looks like now when i combine all the lines okay we call this as superimposed profile okay so you can see in this you don't have a sense of depth they all are superimposing but in this you have a sense of depth okay this complete one is coming first the one which only shown this much seems to be the last one here so in this is called as projected profile in which you can have a sense of depth also that some are ahead some are behind and when i combine and join only the highest elevations i call this as composite profile so profiles are a mathematical and a statistical method in depicting the landscape and relief the profiles are series of curves they are series of curves okay of the vertical cross section and what the profiles do is very important i forgot you can write this down what the profile okay plotting does is it gives a visual perception okay to a landscape so i can see what the landscape looks like there's a visual perception and the three types of profiles here we have the superimposed profiles where i have no clue about the depth okay or what is front what is behind we have projected profiles this tells me there is something behind something be something ahead and if i only join the highest something like a skyline the horizon skyline i call that as a composite profile so did you all understand what profile is okay profile analysis is it okay all of you so pavan what do you want to confirm i have i'm showing it on the white screen okay in the in the projected i show the completeness only in terms of what i can see from front okay 
what I can see from front is something like this. It's something like this. Okay. So say say I'm drawing a mountain. Okay. Say say this is one mountain, another mountain, a third mountain, and maybe a fourth mountain. Okay. Uh, in this diagram, can you tell me? which mountain is in front and which mountain is behind which one is in front one two or three which mountain is in front one two or three no responses here yeah one is in front and which mountain is behind the farthest away which is, is which one three how do you know that how do you know that because you're looking at the graph and sense of completeness but see if i was to draw this one one mountain second mountain and a third mountain now tell me which is front you cannot say yes so if i draw profiles like this we call this as superimposed profiles. All the lines are overlapping. If I draw the profile curves like this, we call this as projected profiles. Okay. And when I draw only the highest point, so when I'm drawing, say, I draw only this one, only the highest points, this, this, this this and this so i've drawn this and this then i call this as composite profile that's all now page number 383 it has a in your savindra singh geomorphology okay 383 has some reference here but a more important reference to this is in another chapter. Okay, now that is more important. That is this chapter on, yeah, let me give you the page here. Yes. Mm. This is uh, the chapter on denudation chronology, uh, Savinder Singh geomorphology. Okay. Uh, page number 312. Page number 312. There's some reference here. Okay. Now, the significance of profile analysis is what? Okay, what is the significance? Okay. Number one, it helps us appreciate, it helps us appreciate the uh, relief diversity. It's a kind of pictorial visualization and it helps us plotting on maps and sheets and a very important usage is it's important in identifying erosion surfaces now, this is the one that i wanted you to move towards it helps us identify erosion surfaces it's a technique that helps us know 
where erosion surfaces are. Okay. Now, how, why? Because if you know this, okay, uh, see, uh, there are three features of erosion surfaces. There are three features of erosion surface. Number one is that they are relatively flat. Number two, they are extensive. And number three, they are nearer to the base level. Okay. So imagine if this is the graph I have and I'm looking at the composite profile. I'm looking at the composite profile of an area. Okay. Tell me, what do you think? Which is an erosion surface? Okay. There is a, it should be flat. It should be extensive. So surface one, surface two, surface three. What do you think is the erosion surface here? Exactly. Three and probably even one could be erosion surface. So once from the map I know this, I can go and check. In fact, I will not even rule out two. It's possible okay, that uh, this area is an erosion surface, but it has been uplifted. So I can study the graph and then I can go and confirm. Okay, so it can be one, two, and three. But what, what I'm very sure is I will try avoiding okay, this area. I'll try avoiding this area. So any extensive flat surface, okay, this is a clue that this could be erosion surface. Then you go and check, okay, physically, if it has the features of erosion surface or not. Okay, so page number, page number 312, okay, has some things, so just two columns, so if you read through that, you have some discussions on how it is used in, okay, the erosion surface, how used in identification of erosion surface. Fine, all of you? Okay. The next question. Uh, not much to add on uh, three and four. The hill processes include erosion, deposition, soil creep. Okay. The hill processes, uh, I'll just give you the page number. There's not much I need to add on this. This is a page number uh, 294, 295, geomorphology. 294 and 295. Okay. Uh, what are the hill processes? Hill processes include soil creep, runoff. It includes overland flow, erosion. Okay. And you know what these terms are. Okay. And how they impact stability? That depends on rainfall, steepness of the slope, and so on. Okay. This one and this question, what are the topographical expressions of folded structure? Now, this is something I suggest you can get ready with. So what are the features of the areas that have fold? Okay, so remember these 
four or five features. Okay. You have got antique lines. Antique lines. You have got sync lines. Okay. Both are part of folds. Then you have consequent reverse. You can have lateral drainage. And you also have what's called as inversion of relief. Inversion of relief. No, nappy structures are features of folds which are undergoing high level of deformations. So we are essentially looking at folds which are tectonically stable. So you can mention that nappy structures are also features, but nappy structures are features of folded area that are undergoing okay, very high amount of tectonic changes. Okay. So, so okay, now listen to me, all of you listen. Okay, listen to this here, all of you. When I'm saying folds, when I'm saying folds, okay, or folded features, Generally, I am referring to there is no tectonic activity anymore. It is an area which is stable. Okay. So stable may I can have anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline. I can have a river here which is called as a master consequent river. I can have a river flowing down the slopes here. We call this as lateral consequent this is the master consequent okay so when you talk about nappy structures recumbent folds these are associated with unstable folding conditions so you can mention but that is not the main focus the main focus is anticline syncline the drainage and something else called as inversion of relief. What happens is anticlines are upfolds, synclines are downfolds. Downfolds become the valleys, the upfolds become the ridges. But if for some reason the upfolds get eroded, the affords get eroded and the down slopes they become elevations so imagine this imagine when the affords have got eroded the affords have got eroded and the down folds they remain so what we'll have is something like this there is there is an elevation but the elevation actually has syncline beds we call this as inversion of relief these are common in himalayas okay so i want your answer when talking about what are the features of folded landscape Antique lines, synclines, lateral consequent rivers, master consequent rivers, okay, plus the possibility of inversion of relief. Okay. You can mention features like nappy structure, but you have to specify it. The nappy structures are the product of tectonic instability in your geomorphology textbook okay please look up page 174 say 176 geomorphology by Savindra Singh uh, I'm sorry 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 uh, 
from 178 up to 180 okay yeah look these pages up 178 to 180 okay so there are diagrams in this and after this you also have one discussion on what are the topographical expressions of domed structure d o m e d domed structure this is in page 182 page 182 pavan how can we have radial drainage in a folded area radial drain is possible only for isolated hills okay Huh. Inversion of relief, where the syncline beds become ridges and the anticline beds become the valleys. The syncline bed become ridges and the anticline beds become the valleys. Reversal. Okay. Yes, we can have trellis also, Akanksha. That's possible. Now, about the life cycle what is the cycle of erosion of folded structure we have an initial stage we have a youthful stage a mature stage and senile stage okay initial stage the upliftment has happened mature stage the drainage has developed youthful stage mature stage we have inversion of relief and senile stage we have flattening okay so initial stage the upliftment has happened in the youthful stage the drainage system develops the consequent rivers they develop in the mature stage we have inversion of relief because of erosion and the senile stage we have flattening now this is in page 180 181 180 181 okay Guys, I am uh, uh, no, moving a bit fast. I hope it's OK, right? I asked your permission. I had to move faster. Some of the concepts you know, so that's how it has okay, helped me. OK, we have moved on. OK, but please try a small sketching or at least read up these and make your jottings, please. OK, OK, fine. Now. Uh, uh, see, I must now stop here because it's my class time now, okay? Yes, I know that Mackenzie Parker question is left. Uh, so, but I must stop here. Uh, now, one change I have indicated, your next class is not tomorrow. It is on, on Thursday at 6 p.m. Okay, it is on Thursday at... Uh, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, it will be environment by Vaishali, ma'am. Those who are in the CCMP program, these topics are different. CCMP, we are trying to cover the course, but the MSP is more about what can be asked now. Okay? And if she wants to extend, she will let you know. We'll have it on Friday at 6 p.m. Okay, so so uh, thereafter I'll continue. I'll give you the schedule for the next week. Okay, paper two also. Yes, we will discuss. I'll discuss the important section of paper two also. The next theme I was taking up was population and, and settlement. Okay, so I'll give you a routine for the next week. Next two weeks, in fact. Okay. Okay. Any answer for today? I will share. I have discussed the answer with you. I'll put it on your mail, okay? And you can have a look. Okay, so I'm 
I just have 20 minutes to get ready and shoot out. So guys, I'll catch you up again. Thank you for joining us. Okay, and uh, please uh, do your revision and uh, we'll try improvising on this. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. God bless all of you. Bye-bye. Take care.